1952, director John Ford and star John Wayne gave the world a feisty love story set in idyllic Ireland. In 2022, we return to Ireland to try a true whiskey of the people. The film is The Quiet Man. The whiskey is Bushmills. And we'll review them both. This is the The Film Film and Whiskey Whiskey Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at John Ford's 1952 classic, The Quiet Man. Now, Brad, this is a movie that, if I'm being frank, got on here because I know you had seen it. And I have seen it. I own it. I love this movie. It's just a fun little movie. Like, I don't really know that uh, we're going to have a lot to dissect or analyze here today, but it's just like, you know, it's just a nice little movie. Yeah, this is one of the most incredibly fun movies, if not the most fun movie that John Wayne has ever done. Oh, my gosh. I like I couldn't believe what uh, capital F, capital W, fun Wayne brought to the table here. Like, I'm just (laughs) I'm so not used to seeing John Wayne be fun. And I'm, you know, I'm used to seeing him have a swagger and a sort of like, uh, what's the word? Like, not flippant attitude, but he's always kind of wry, you know? Yeah. But in this one, he's just legitimately playing a completely different type of character. And it was the most charming I've ever seen John Wayne in a movie. Yeah, he, there's a sincerity to his performance Mm -hmm. that I think outshines a lot of his other roles. It's just the fact that he comes in. As a man who is completely confident in himself and knows what he wants and doesn't feel the need to show off for anyone else. Mm. Yeah. I think that's what I really love about this character. The funny thing is, too, I, I I would almost use that description to describe most of his other characters. And it's not that this character is more self-conscious or anything. It definitely still fits your description. But there was something, I guess the word that I would use is like softer in his mm-hmm. demeanor and in his performance here. Um, more lighthearted. More lighthearted. And there's a boyishness to him that I, I'm not used to seeing. And it really like, you know, I think he's like 43, 44 ish when this movie is filmed. But uh, his face looks so much softer and more, I guess, just uh, I'll keep using the word boyish. There's a youth to him that I think for a good portion of his 30s and 40s, the movies he was making He was trying to distance himself from that. And I really loved watching him embrace that here. Yeah. And he's and he is paired with the absolute perfect counterpart in Maureen O'Hara. I remember you at one point telling me, Brad, that Maureen O'Hara might have been like your most beautiful movie star ever. Like this was this was somebody that's like, you know, one of Brad's all time movie crushes. Yeah, she is absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, as with all people who are attractive, it has so much to do with her personality Mm. and her feistiness and spunk and her ability to hold her own in any relationship that she has in this in this movie. Mm -hmm. I I just think she's spectacular in this film. So I'm kind of diving into this episode today, Brad, not having done as much background as we typically do on our films, mostly because I think just the the overall vibe of this movie is like this is a laid back, fun movie where we're all just going to go be happy in Ireland. And I'm OK with kind of just, you know, for lack of a better term, talking about this movie at the surface level today. And I think it kind of fits in this mini subgenre we've created on our podcast of movies that fall into that vein where it's like, don't take it too seriously. It's a genre movie from the early 50s. You know, I would pair this up with like an American in Paris. I would pair this up with like the African Queen, which is a movie I know you didn't like that much. But just in terms of like the overall vibe of both of those movies, I think this kind of fits in there really, really well. And Within those within that subgenre, obviously, we can have favorites. But do you know what I'm kind of getting at here? Yeah, there, there's a certain category of movies that you just put on to enjoy mm-hmm. that, that you just really want to have a good time. And honestly, I hadn't watched The Quiet Man in 
probably since I was a teenager until about, oh, I don't know, six, eight months ago, the, uh, was TCM putting it on in the theaters? Uh, yeah. With, fa- yep, with the Fathom events. Yeah. Fathom events. Thank you. Yeah. They did a Fathom event and they showed it and my dad and I went and saw it because I know my dad loves this movie and. Man, watching this movie in theaters was just an incredibly fun experience. This movie is gorgeous. Like it is it is not just Ireland. It is just impeccable cinematography. And I I want to talk a little bit about the shot compositions and stuff later on down the road. But I called out American in Paris and the African Queen in particular because Brad, this is like the maybe the third or fourth movie we've ever done where the movie was filmed in you know the United Kingdom in the early 50s and used their film stock and used their technicolor process and when you're as nerdy about movies as I am when you watch early color films from England they look so much different than early color films from America there's mm-hmm. just like a little bit softer hues and there's like a uh, almost like a creaminess to people's like skin tones it's it's just really gorgeous and this movie man in the first two or three minutes, I just hit pause, I'd say five times and just lingered on some shots because it is just beautifully composed. Yeah, the the way the camera moves throughout the setting, it almost feels like you're just a person walking through these gorgeous Irish fields. Like it, it feels like it is a part of the story. And mm-hmm. I, I think that the choice to use Ward Bond as the uh, narrator helps with that. That it, it gives you this sense of like we're just outsiders looking in on a cute little love story, and but everything about it works together. And and, and you're right, the way the cinematography is used here, you just get to enjoy Ireland for what it is, and you know make you want to book a ticket over there as soon as possible. All right, Brad, I think we've gotten a little bit too far down the rabbit hole for people who may not have seen the film yet. We should probably give them a proper introduction by way of our segment, Brad Explains. And as we get into Brad Explains, we do want to say, hey, if it is your first time with us, welcome into the podcast. If it's your 200 and whatever this is, 75th episode with us, thanks for sticking around this long. We would love for you to consider joining us at our Patreon, patreon.com slash film whiskey, where you can support the podcast at three different tiers, a three, five and seven dollar a month tier. At all three of those tiers, you get access to a special discord server that Brad and I are on every single day. At each successive tier, you get more and more perks. Brad and I are actually going to record a special bonus episode just for our $7 a month patrons right after we finish this one. So please consider joining. We'd love to have you on board. Patreon.com slash film whiskey. Brad, we have put 60 seconds on the clock for you. Can you break down the admittedly thin plot of, (laughs) of The Quiet Man? I think I might be able to handle it. Uh, A retired American boxer named Sean Thornton. Well, I guess he's not technically American because he was born in Ireland. So uh, a retired Irish turned American turned back into Irish boxer named Sean Thornton uh, moves back to his small hometown of Innisfree. And he falls very quickly in love with the lovely Mary Kate Danaher. Uh, he's assisted in his endeavors by uh, a, a old matchmaker drunkard named Michelin O'Flynn. Uh, the local Catholic priest, Father Lonergan, helps him out. But he falls into a duel with uh, Squire Red Will Danaher, who refuses to help him uh, win the hand of his sister uh, because he bought property that uh, that Red wanted to buy. And they fight. And they trick Red, and they have horse races, and it's just a a romp of a tale, and it's a great time, Bob. All right, Brad, this is where I'm going to give a little bit of context for where I'm at with this movie, because I I, I don't want to let you down at the end of the episode. I really like this movie. I like it a lot. I think that there is, like, a ceiling for how good movies like this can be. (laughs) (laughs) This is at that ceiling. You know what I'm saying? But I think you probably are going to give this movie a little bit of a higher score than me. And at the end of the day, what it really comes down to for me is that I think this movie could be at least 30 minutes shorter than it is. 
One hundred percent. And like when I before I watched it, you you know, you had watched it a few days ago and I was like, yeah, is this like a like a sub two hour movie? And you were like, no, it's like at least two hours and ten or something like that. Yeah, it's two oh nine. Yeah, man. Everything you said in Brad Explains up until about the 50 second mark happens in the first 10 minutes of the movie. And then the last (laughs) thing you said, which is they fight, happens at the end of the movie. And there is an hour and a half in between in which very little happens. Yeah, I think that this movie should be about an hour and 40 minutes, hour and 45 minutes. Yep. Um, it, It just runs on about 15, 20 minutes too long. They draw out certain parts of the story of of Sean, like acclimating himself to the to the village and trying to win Mary Kate. That just takes way too long. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, Bob, I don't know if there's much wrong with this movie. No, it's a very charming movie. And I think that what what might let some people down if they go into this knowing John Ford, knowing John Wayne is that it tells such a small, intimate story. And it's again, like I think the goal of this movie is just to be a charming little diversion and it's very artfully made. I don't want to act like this is just like a throwaway movie, but I mean, we've, we've traced the plot here. A guy moves to Ireland. He has some secrets in his past, which never really get explored at all. (laughs) And, uh, He wins the heart of somebody and has to fight her brother. And that's really the end of the movie. And Mm -hmm. and to take they they become very good friends. Yes. (laughs) Also at the end of the movie. So like to take two hours and nine minutes to tell that story. I mean, that's essentially as long as like Jurassic Park. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if we need a Jurassic Park length movie to, to do the quiet man. I mean, if there's anything I've said about Jurassic Park, it should have been like an hour and nine minute movie. Yeah. If there's anything I've said about Jurassic Park, it's that we should have let these dinosaurs loose in the village of Innisfree and, and oh, really just a mashup. Yeah. And all of a sudden, Chris Pratt's riding through. <laughs> 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 all right, man. So where would you like to start here? I think, you know, we can either talk about John Ford's direction and some of the behind the scenes stuff, or we can jump into the performances. Let's just talk about Ward Bond for a second. Oh, my gosh. He might, he might be the perfect supporting actor of all time. Here's the thing about Ward Bond. I spent a a solid portion of this movie after, you know, I I praised Ward Bond last week with The Searchers, just kind of looking at Ward Bond and saying, like, why was this guy stuck as a character actor? Because he's he's, gorgeous. He's a very good looking man. (laughs) Like, right? Like, broad shouldered, in great shape. He's, you know, again, he's a few years older than John Wayne. I think he's almost like 50 at this point. Um, He's got like a great voice, great voice, beautiful smile like this man should have been a leading actor. And so I went on his IMDb and and it seems like from the beginning he was just kind of a supporting actor. And hey, if that's what he wanted to do, good for him. But I really feel like, you know, I I listened to a few other movie podcasts and, and on one of them, the host always talks about how sometimes somebody comes along that market corrects for somebody else and takes mm. all their roles and uh I realize that I think Ward Bond looks a lot like Fred McMurray, you know, from Double huh. Indemnity and yes, from The yeah. Apartment. And, and mm-hmm. you know, Fred McMurray's a few years younger. And so I just kind of wonder, like, did Fred McMurray swallow up all of the Ward Bond parts? Because I know I like Fred McMurray and I like all the movies that he's in. Ward Bond is a better actor than Fred McMurray yeah, is. And, easily. And it really kind of bothers me that this guy didn't have the career <laughs> that he deserved. Yeah, I think that he feels like somebody who would like go home to a really middle class home with six children and just be like act like he had just gone and like worked on the roads all day on a road crew. <laughs> like like he just seems like he would be an incredibly down to earth kind of guy. Mm-hmm. And may- maybe he just didn't have that uh main character vibes. You know? Maybe I, I guess. I don't know, man. Gave like, it off as like... Even as an older guy in this movie, you know, and I say older in quotation marks, but, you know, older than, than John Wayne, of course. I'm like, you know, I would still totally buy a movie with Ward Bond as the romantic lead at this yeah. age. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if Cary Grant can do it into the 60s, like, this guy could do it. Right. I mean, yeah. He was actually only four years older than uh, John Wayne. Right. So just barely older, and I'm with you, man. I think Ward Bond easily deserved a few leading roles, and if not, like, Academy uh, nominations for what he did. I definitely agree. So let's let's jump into a couple of the other supporting characters here. I think 
you know, the primary one to talk about would be Barry Fitzgerald, who just made a career out of being like Irish. You know what I mean? Like, like that's kind <laughs> yeah. of just he's like, I'm really going to lean into every stereotype you have and just embody, you know, I'm going to be the Boston Celtics leprechaun on screen. And that's kind of yeah. what he is. He he wins an Oscar in 1944 for a movie called Going My Way, which I think also really falls into the vein of this film in that it's just happy and charming and cheesy and over the top in, in terms of schmaltz. Uh, I love that movie, Brad, and I'd I'd love to watch it for the podcast someday. But Barry Fitzgerald essentially plays the same character. He's a priest in that movie, so he's not drunk, but he's just a very <laughs> Irish priest. And, yeah. and that's kind of it. Yeah. Well, if he was a very Irish priest, then he probably would have been drunk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I think that Hollywood has this problem sometimes where they find one person to play all of the uh, ethnic roles, if you will. Mm -hmm. Like, let's be really honest. If you think about a Japanese character in a movie, you're probably in a modern movie, you're probably going to think about Ken Watanabe. Yep. Like, yeah, you know, and and I don't say that in any way to put Ken Watanabe down. I think he's genuinely a good actor, but I, I think it's more of the casting directors who are like, yeah, we have a Japanese male, older, middle aged. Yeah. Why don't you just give Ken a call? Yeah. <laughs> like I. So I don't know. I, I think that Barry Fitzgerald probably fits into that character, into that role for 1940s, 50s, 60s Hollywood. Yeah, definitely. And then you've got Victor McLaughlin playing Squire Red Will Danaher. Also, hold on wait, one second. Throughout this movie, the pronunciation of their last name changes a million times. Like it's yeah. it's it's Danaher. It's Donaher. I got a Donager at one point, even though yep. the way it's spelled doesn't even have a G in it. So, like, I know this movie is not shooting for complete accuracy from its American people doing Irish accents. But, like, <laughs> I don't even really know what their last name is. So. He's playing Squire Red, and uh, this is Maureen O'Hara's brother. He's good. I don't really have many notes on him. He's he's a big burly man who's angry for most of the movie. He he does a fine job. Yeah, I think that his best moments are like at the horse race when uh, they're springing the trap on him and telling him that like, well, of course the uh, widow would have married you by now, but you already have a woman in the house. And, you know, uh, one of a and who who would think of having two women in the house? Mm. One of them redheaded at that. Right. It's those moments where he like starts to ponder and like think and scheme. And I'm like, Victor McLaughlin can like actually act a little bit. I, I feel like he had to have been a real life boxer <laughs> at some point. He just has that vibe mm -hmm. about him. But uh, in those little moments, I'm like, you know, maybe maybe I'm just speaking poorly about him. He just comes across as a big old dumb brute <laughs> and you can see the wheels in his tiny little brain turning. Yeah. And if that's him acting, then he's killing it. Yeah. If that's just who he is, then uh, he's guy. also killing it yeah. for the role. You know? <laughs> um okay, let's let's go back to John Wayne. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that I really loved this performance from him and I'm I'm happy that the two Ford movies we picked with John Wayne in them where two performances where he's out of his wheelhouse a little bit or, you know, or stretching himself first with Ethan Edwards in the searchers and here as Sean in the quiet man. And really these are two opposite ends of the spectrum for him where, you know, in the searchers, he is very closed off and gruff and haggard and evil in a lot of ways. And in this movie, it's him at his most kind of pure and good hearted and I really, really loved watching John Wayne in this movie. And I think this is only in what, Brad, the third John Wayne movie we've done, if you count Stagecoach from way back in season one or two. Yeah, I believe so. We we need to get around to True Grit. I think we should at some point. But between The Searchers and this, I don't really know that it gets better for John Wayne. These are two really good performances. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that True Grit is a really phenomenal performance from him much later in his career. I think that's like, what, 68, 69? 69, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, he's a very much older man at that point. I think that this is the height of John Wayne's career. Hmm. And like you said, it's the fact that he goes from The Searchers and just this incredibly intense, uh, almost introspective performance to a really lighthearted, 
Um, I, I love the word you you were using earlier, Bob. He he just comes across as like a 42 year old that's acting like a 26 year old, mm-hmm. and he's just boyish. That, that's a really good term. And but he does it in such a way that is honoring to the character and doesn't feel pedantic. Yeah. And so he yeah, you're right, man. These are two of his best performances. I did find it really interesting the more I got into the film that the movie's called The Quiet Man and it's adapted from a short story. So, like, you know, I don't remember if they they carried the name over with it or not, but John Wayne's character really isn't that quiet in this movie. You know what I mean? But I think the thing mm. that makes him come across as a quiet man is that he's not domineering. And John Wayne so often in his roles was the guy that would cut you off and talk over you and, you know, just be the loudest guy in the room. And he's he's not that imposing figure here. He's a guy that's definitely, you know, again, you find out halfway through the movie that he's a boxer who killed a guy in the ring. And that's why he's coming home to Ireland to try to escape that past. So he's got secrets, but he he doesn't have uh, malice in his heart. And mm. he lets other people talk and finish their sentences. <laughs> and I'm just like, man, I love polite John Wayne. This is just yeah. a, it's a joy to hang out with this person. Well, and not just polite, but romantic. Yes. You know, like the the line that really stuck with me is is when Mary Kate comes over and kind of cleans the house before he moves in. And, you know, they're they're having a conversation and she's about to run off. And he goes, well, some things a man doesn't get over so easy. And she asks him what? And the way he delivers this next line, you know, like a, the sight of a girl coming through the fields with the sun on her hair, kneeling in church with a face like a saint and coming to a man's house to clean it for him. And then, you know, she she kind of protests a little bit. And he, But the way he delivers this line, I know it was Mary-Kate Danaher. And it was nice of you. Mm. Like, it's just incredibly polite and romantic <laughs> And soft. Yeah. And like you recognize that this man has a heart of gold. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I I just thought that Wayne pulled it off. And honestly, if I had watched every single John Wayne movie leading up to this point, I don't know if I would have thought he could pull dialogue like that off. Yeah. Well, but and, he and, just knocks it out of the park. And it's a credit to John Wayne for being able to do it, but it's also a credit to Ford. And I think we really haven't talked a lot about Ford as a director during our John Ford retrospective, like all three of these episodes. And obviously his relationship with John Wayne is what defines his career. This is this is his muse more than anybody else. I, I guess in real life, uh, you know, Ford was just an and he was an to John Wayne, too. But mm-hmm. John Wayne owed his whole career to him and. They made a movie back in the the early 1930s. I want to say it was called like The Big Sky. It was called The Big Something. And it was a huge flop. We talked about this on the Stagecoach episode. And Mm -hmm. and John Wayne's career doesn't take off for like another eight or nine years with Stagecoach again. But he remembered Ford. He always wanted to work with Ford. And he looked up to Ford kind of like a father. There was like a boyishness to it. And so he would do anything Ford wanted him to do. And it's only John Ford that can convince John Wayne to do a performance like this, to be softer, to not put on this uh, super masculine machismo thing that he always felt so compelled to do. And it's really I mean, if there's an actor in Hollywood that I wouldn't expect to pull off a role like this, just like you said, it would be John Wayne. And the fact that that Ford was able to get this performance out of him says a lot about their relationship. Yeah, it really does. I, I think that Ford for for all of his foibles he has an ability with his actors to just draw out really great performances. Mm -hmm. And I I think in all three of the movies that we watched for him this year, I'm just really impressed in an era with lots of really over the top, really cheesy performances. It seems like Ford has an ability to help his actors feel like real people who inhabit a real world. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I know that in in The Searchers, we talked about how Wayne, you know, comes across as serious and everybody else has a bit of a Western feel to them. But even that I look at and I go, well, the fact that he pulled it off with Wayne is is pretty incredible. So, yeah, I think that him as a director of actors, it, he really does an impressive job. Brad, I'm going to ask if we can hold off on tar- talking about Maureen O'Hara until after the break, because you know, if there are any problematic parts of this movie, they kind of revolve around her character anyway. So let's press pause here 
Let's try this Bushmills, and then we'll come back and talk about Maureen O'Hara. What do you say? Let's, yeah, let's do it, man. I'm in. All right, today we are checking out Bushmills Irish Whiskey. Brad, it is really good to get back to a brand where we are trying like their most basic offering. We're not mm, trying some yeah. weird finish. We're not trying some weird one off here. We're talking about the like one of the most popular Irish whiskeys on the market. It's just Bushmills White Label. And I am incredibly excited to pair it with the Quiet Man. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know how we came around to this idea. <laughs> <laughs> don't know how it quite fits. I have but, no you know, idea. He, here we are. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this product. Uh, if you've ever seen an Irish whiskey section in a store, you've seen Bushmills White Label. This is, like I said, a very, very popular whiskey on the front of the bottle on the label. It says uh, <laughs> 1608 in big old uh, numbers. I almost said letters. And that's the first little bit of marketing. Uh, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, Ploy. Uh, sleight of hand ah, because the distillery that this comes from the bush mills old distillery was not established until 1784 but those uh, liars the 1608 thing is apparently a reference to some land grant or something that uh, they were allowed to start distilling whiskey in this county in 1608 it but took this them distillery... almost 200 years <laughs> to put out a product for this distillery <laughs> to come into place you know uh, they just wanted to seem older than they are, even though I feel like 1784 would have been plenty old. Perf yeah, perfectly <laughs> ancient enough to be considered ancient, ancient age, if you will. So like many Irish whiskeys, this is not a single malt whiskey. It's not a single pot still whiskey. It is a blend of single malt Irish whiskey that is triple distilled and a lighter grain Irish whiskey. So not made from malt, made from a mixture of other grains. They blend these two together and then they age it for at least three years in a combination of used bourbon barrels and used Oloroso sherry casks. So this is actually a very similar process to what we see with a lot of Irish whiskeys. I know that uh, when we did Aberlour, that's a single malt, but their aging process is part in bourbon barrels, part in sherry casks. So this may or may not end up having some of those great malty, you know, scotch single malt notes on the nose for us. I'm really looking forward to what this has to offer. Yeah. And I guess I'll just say this. If you know anything about Bushmills, you know that it is not a very expensive whiskey. No. Um, so for me, I'll, you know, I'll reflect that in my value score. But just know this going in that this is a $22.50 bottle of whiskey. And like you said at the start, Bob, I'm excited to get into a super baseline offering of whiskey because I, I feel like it's it's like we're getting in touch with our roots. Yeah. I mean, listen, we just did Cuddy Sark at the end of last season or was it the beginning yeah. of this season? And that was like a $15 bottle of scotch. And I have yeah. nothing against that. And in fact, we gave it such high scores that I remember some of our Patreon patrons wrote into us and said, hey, I went out and bought a bottle of Cuddy Sark. I'm so excited. And then we asked mm -hmm. them what they thought, and they were like, well, it was okay. And I was like, dude, it was a $15 <laughs> bottle of scotch. Like, temper yeah. your expectations here. <laughs> so this is, again, $22. It's 80 proof. Let's dive into the nose here, Brad. And when I stick my nose in this Glen Cairn and get a whiff of this, it has a, such a light, fruity, fragrant kind of bouquet to it. And I really, really love it, man. Like, it... It has the brightness, almost like a melon kind of thing that we get sometimes mm -hmm. on Irish whiskey. Yeah, it, it for me, it's got a decent amount of honey going on as, as almost like a baseline foundational note. And then on top of that, I get a, a little bit of like a light citrus, a few herbal notes. And honestly, the longer I spent with this, the more I realized that it, it almost smells exactly like a white wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a ton of like, Almost like just grape skin. You're totally right. It reminds me even even less than white wine. It reminds me or I guess even more than white wine. It reminds me of those fake like Welch's sparkling juice. Mm, yeah, like a sparkling white grape juice. Yes. 100 yeah. percent, man. I love this. Uh, you know, again, twenty two dollars. Like, hell yeah. Here, here. I'm going to give it an eight and a half out of ten on the nose. Yeah, I, I'll give it a seven out of ten on the nose. I Like, I think it's it's fine and fun. Fun fact. I don't like white wine that much. So, <laughs> so you're just you know, going to ding it. Not quite an eight and a half for me, but I recognize what they're doing here. <laughs> there is very little alcohol on the nose here, and it smells mm -hmm. like it's going to be very light in flavor. 
And one thing that I do kind of hate about Irish whiskey is that it smells so fruity and sweet on the nose, almost whiny. And then when you take a sip of it, it's usually that's where the malt comes out. And it's a mm-hmm. completely opposite, you know, flavor wheel flavor. And that always pisses me off. So, like, I want this to be really sweet, but based on prior experience, I don't think it will be. But that's still not going to affect my my nosing score. Let's dive into the palate, though, Brad. Yeah, on the, on the taste for me, it was very light and airy, which is code word for thin, but mm-hmm. I like it. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's citrus, there's honey, a little bit of vanilla going on. But for me, it really had a nice kind of floral bouquet, almost like a rose petal type of note going on that I, I really liked. It, it was a little bit of a step up from the nose for me. I'll, I'll give it a seven and a half on the taste. Sometimes when you're like reading tasting notes, you see that there's a note of cereal and it doesn't necessarily mean breakfast cereal, but it means it has that greeniness to it. Um, This definitely tastes to me like a very unsweetened cereal note, whatever that might mean to you. Uh, It gets it not bitter at all. And in fact, on the very front of the palate, there's some kind of just generic sweetness going on Uh, more sweet than I expected it to be. But as it kind of like you know, continues its journey across my palate, it gets less and less sweet and more and more malty. And I don't mind it, but you're right. It's really, really thin. There's very little alcohol burn. And it kind of just seems like it almost seems like shy to announce itself. (laughs) Do you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, like, hey, I'm just going to it's like the Midwest ope. Like when we bump into someone and say, oh, like, <laughs> uh, excuse me, like, I'm just going to sneak past you here. Like th- this is going to give you a little bit of a taste. This whiskey just wants to sneak right on past you. I'm not saying it's bad. It just it sucks that it doesn't have more of a punch to it, that it doesn't like lean fully into that fruity character. Uh, I think I'm only going to give it a six out of ten on the taste, Brad. Yeah. And and the finish, it's short and pleasant. Um, For me, it just slightly soured at the very end of the experience. Which lowered my score a bit. I, I'll give it a six and a half on the finish. I, I think it's decent, but nothing to write home about. Yeah, I get almost a like an artificial sweetener thing on the very, very end of this. And it's not it's not like aspartame. It's uh, what's the one in like the green packet, like stevia. Like it almost has yes. like a stevia aftertaste to me, which mm-hmm. is like a weird note that I've never gotten on a whiskey. But I mean, that's what's going on here for me. It tastes like unsweetened like uh, oats or cream of wheat or something. And then on the very back of it, it's like, oh, also, here's a packet of stevia to make that taste better. (laughs) Um, I'm not digging this, man. And I'm really bummed because the nose was so promising. Once again, I'll give the finish a six out of 10. Yeah. And the the balance for me, I, I literally just wrote down like, there's not much to see here. Like, it's just a really nice, pleasant, bright Irish whiskey. Like, you can just move along to your next whiskey. Enjoy this for what it is. It's fine. There's yeah. there's nothing to complain about for this $22 bottle of whiskey. I'll give it a seven and a half on balance. Yeah, this is always the hard one to do when we don't really care for the whiskey, but the balance is there, right? Like, I don't want to reward it for being mediocre across the mm-hmm. board, but it's also like- But it's I, consistent. I, yeah, and I feel weird giving it a six out of 10 on balance because it seems pretty well balanced. So- I'll I'll give it a seven on the balance, and that takes us into value. Where Brad, as you've said, this is what twenty two fifty in the state of Ohio. Yep. Well, I'm sorry, twenty two dollars and forty nine cents. Oh, there you go. They couldn't just round up and make it a twenty three dollar bottle of whiskey. Yeah, <laughs> that, that would be pricing themselves out of the market here. That's right. Uh, I don't mind this at twenty three dollars. It's definitely less than a bottle of Jameson. I think Jameson's up to like twenty seven or twenty eight dollars now. Hmm. I think I still like Jameson better than this, though. But when you're talking about like a four to five dollar difference, we're talking about, you know, like a quarter of this thing's value. So, Mm -hmm. man, I don't know. I'm vamping a lot because I don't know where to put this. I guess I'll give it a seven out of ten on value. It's a really good value, but it's just not a great whiskey. Yeah, I I think for me, I'm going to give it an eight and a half out of 10 on value. I I think that this is a really solid Irish whiskey for a really solid price that, you know, yeah, if you if you want to spend about 30 bucks, you can go get Jameson. And I love Jameson. Honestly, we need to have some Tullamore Dew on this podcast because I like Tullamore Dew. Mm. But uh, hold on. What was the movie we did? Tullamore Dew. Was that like Green Book? It was like one of the very first ones we ever did. We should have done Cuddy Sark with Green Book. <laughs> I know. I wasn't thinking back then. 
Well, I'm glad you've started thinking now and uh, <laughs> paired the quiet man <laughs> with, with Bushmills. Uh, but yeah, I, I think eight and a half on value is a, is a fair place for this. All right. So that's bringing me out to a 34.5 out of 50. Brad, what are you coming out to? Uh, just a little bit higher. I'm at a 37 out of 50. Oh, nice. All right. So that's bringing us out to a 71.5 out of 100 or a 35.75 out of 50. I think, Brad, if we're being honest, like if you just looked at this whiskey and and didn't take into account how we score our categories, this whiskey is not really a 35 out of 50 whiskey. But when you consider that we do value and that we are mm-hmm. taking the $23 price tag into consideration, I get it. I get that this is where it's ending up. Yeah, I think that the here's the interesting thing, Bob. I think we might be one of the only people that like truly sits down and does a tasting notes on the Bushmills whiskey. <laughs> like most people who buy this aren't going to be buying it to like sit down, put it in a Glen Cairn and take 20 minutes, 30 minutes to like sample it out and think about what they think about this whiskey. Yeah. Uh so but see, here's the thing. The case, like, like hold on, like if you're buying this, then you're probably either just trying to consume it as quickly as possible and in as large of quantities as possible, or <laughs> it's a mixer. But I don't know that I would think that this would be a great mixer. It's just too subtle and too, I don't know, Specific. non non attention grabbing. Yeah. I feel like it yeah, would get swallowed I, up by everything else in your cocktail. Yeah, I, I like this on its own. And I agree. I don't know if it would stand out well enough in a cocktail. As far as if I would recommend it or not, I'd recommend. I, I mean, it's cheap enough. Well, go for it, man. If you like Irish whiskey, then there's a good chance you like this. Honestly, if you have a you know loved one, a spouse who enjoys white wine, I think this actually might be a good way for you to get them into whiskey. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely there on the, on the nose, but it, it could backfire and they could just get really pissed off that the rest of the experience is nothing <laughs> like white, white wine. <laughs> and then they'll start acting like Maureen O'Hara towards you. There you go. <laughs> All right, man. So this has been Bushmills White Label. I think we both hesitantly recommend the whiskey or recommend with a caveat, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. All right. Let's get back into talking about The Quiet Man. What do you say? Let's get to it. All right, everybody. That was Bushmills, a whiskey from Ireland <laughs> that Bob and I were like solid on. <laughs> I thought you were just going to end it with that. It was a, a whiskey. whiskey. <laughs> it was from Ireland. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> We're moving on to The Quiet Man, which was decidedly a film. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brad, it is time for what is rapidly becoming my favorite segment, Two Facts and a Falsehood. This is where Brad presents three items to me, all of them presented as fact, uh, one of which is a bold-faced lie. Brad, I'm doing pretty well this season. I can't remember the what exact is, number right now, but I'm like... What does that saying mean? Bald-faced. Also, is it bold-faced or bald-faced? Because I think it's bald-faced. I, I think it's B-A-L-D. Yeah, I thought so, too. But, like, does that mean that people who shave are just liars? Or does that mean that all women are liars if they're they're not growing beards? I don't know. We'll have to look that up. Yeah. It needs to be a whole bonus episode, I think. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, uh, we're doing two truths and a lie right now. And so Brad's going to hit me with these items. I was trying to give myself a pat on the back by saying... I think I'm like nine and six now. Oh, no, I, I strategically interrupted. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, had, I had to give myself my flowers here, though. So, yeah, all right, you're doing Brad, great, man. Let's do it. All right, fact number one. The final line of the wedding toast got censored by the uh, company Republic Pictures, who made the movie. Uh, it should have said, may their days be long and full of happiness. May their children be many and full of health. And may they live in peace and national freedom. But after the film was completed, Republic Pictures decided that national freedom in Ireland was a little bit too controversial a subject. Mm. Fact number two, Maureen O'Hara was initially reluctant to work with Wayne again after having a bit of a cool relationship with him on their first film, Rio Grande. However, they enjoyed their time so much together on The Quiet Man that they became close and lifelong friends. Hmm. Fact number three. During the filming of uh, one of the takes of the scene where John Wayne first kisses Maureen O'Hara, she slaps him in the face. However, he blocks her blow. And the first time they did that, she broke a bone in her hand. Uh, 
Wow. However, the movie was not being filmed in like a sequential order, so she was not allowed to wear a cast to fix the broken bone. That sounds like something John Ford would do. Um <laughs> Man, these Brad, these all sound very plausible. This is your best written one in in a a while. Hey, thanks, man. Um I can see two being true, but that also seems like the easiest one to concoct. Now I'm trying to figure out like which one did you write? I'm just over here drinking whiskey, man. I like number two. I like number three as fact. I'm going to say one is the falsehood. I don't know if number one has ever been the falsehood before, but I'm going to go ahead and say (laughs) one is the falsehood. Bob, your streak has been broken. Number one was true. Okay. Yeah. Maureen O'Hara was not reluctant to work with Wayne again. I just made that up. Okay, cool. I I mean, I just uh, assumed that, you know, people would be reluctant to work with John Wayne. (laughs) Here's the crazy thing. Uh, There is a ton of Hollywood rumors that during John Wayne's second or third marriage that he didn't just have an affair with Maureen O'Hara. They had like a four to five year long affair. Yeah, that sounds about right. So, yep. You know, eh. they had great chemistry. You know, sometimes you got to commit to the role. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's method acting, Brad. I was going to say it's method acting, and it's honey, honey. Uh, I promise I don't actually like her. I'm just method acting. I'm just sleeping with her for the role. <laughs> for the role. Do you like the money I'm bringing? Also, you? the next three roles. Oh, speaking of misogyny, <laughs> yeah, let's talk about Maureen O'Hara in this movie. <laughs> Here's the thing, Brad. I think that this movie could be by today's standards, accused of being misogynistic. I mean, you have an entire scene towards the end of the film where he is just literally dragging her across the Irish meadows. And and, and and they like make a make a point of saying it's like a six or seven mile walk. And a woman comes up at some point and says, like, oh, here's a nice stick for you to beat the lady with, (laughs) you know, but that that honestly reminded me of uh, the opening scene of Boondock Saints (laughs) when they're talking about the uh, the rule of thumb. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> He's like, you just can't have a piece of wood to as big as your wrist. It can only be as big <laughs> as your thumb. <laughs> I don't know that I would consider this movie to be misogynistic. I, I think that part of it is that they so clearly establish within the, the world of this movie, the rules of Innisfree and how mm-hmm. there are these already outmoded sort of cultural customs and norms And John Wayne just kind of leverages them to his advantage at the end of the movie. And so, like, I'm not interested, frankly, Brad, in doing a conversation on, like, does this age well by today's standards? Because, of course, it doesn't. But but also, like, I don't think this movie is mean to its female characters. Mm -mm. No, honestly, if I can dip my toes into those waters for a second... The second time watching this through, you know, re- recently, I watched it a few times as a kid, the, watching it through this time, I realized, I was like, if we're being really honest about this movie, I think it's actually a super progressive movie yes. for 1952. 100%. Like, the idea that a American, you know, boxer who has made millions of dollars would come to Ireland and fully respect the wishes of the local culture and honor them and, you know, go about the process of matchmaking. And, you know, he pushes the boundaries a little bit. He kisses her a little earlier than he's supposed to. But there's a sense that he genuinely loves and cares about her. Mm -hmm. And the way he goes about talking about money and the way he goes about talking about her possessions. Yeah. I, I just was incredibly impressed with the dignity that I feel like John Ford gives Maureen O'Hara in this movie. I'm 100 percent with you. And I think that that character is where I would focus that argument, because we've talked a lot on this podcast, you know, and again, we are two like straight white males. It's it's hard to have these conversations without like somebody <laughs> <laughs> so, like without having a female uh, co-host here. And we're like, no, it's not misogynistic. Like, I understand how this sounds. But what I'm saying is. We've talked a lot on this podcast about films that sort of rob their female characters of agency. Mm -hmm. And this movie is like her entire thing. The inciting incident is that they cannot get married because Victor McLaughlin won't let them. And so they kind of trick him into it. 
And once he discovers that he's been tricked into it, it's too late. They're married. But she basically says, like, I'm going to withhold sex from you, John Wayne. I am going to, like, (laughs) refuse to do the things you expect of me as a wife until Mm -hmm. you help me get what's mine. He took the dowry away, her brother. And so she's like, that's mine. And John Wayne's basically saying, like, you're getting hung up on the wrong thing. We can be together now. Don't you love me? And she's like, put all that aside. I have very little in this world. I want the things that are mine. And for her to be able as a character in the early 1950s, and especially in the culture that this movie is portraying, to be able to dig her heels in and say, no, like this is my decision and you're going to respect it, I think is an incredibly progressive message for this film. Yeah. Well, and also when you look at the actions that, you know, Sean Thornton takes as a character, Like, you know, she locks the door on him and he kicks the door down and is like, hey, there's not going to be any locked doors in this house. He throws her on the bed. It breaks a little bit. It's it's a, a, a gag. But what does he do after that? He takes his sleeping bag and he sleeps out yep. in the main room. Yep. Like. It, his anger there wasn't, oh, you're not having sex with me. It which, was, which is the hey. opposite of what we saw in Gone with the Wind. Do you remember that scene mm-hmm. where Red Butler comes up the stairs and and like lifts her up and says, like, you're not going to cast me out of our bed, Scarlett O'Hara. And the the implication is, like, did she actually want this and is just playing hard to get? Or is she kind of being raped within the context of her marriage? Mm -hmm. And you're right. This movie takes the complete opposite tack there. Yeah. Yeah. He just basically says, we're not going to have locked doors in here. Like, like, it's fine. You can you can kick me out of the bed, but we're going to have open lines of communication. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's. That's, That's a pretty really healthy, <laughs> modern, healthy. <laughs> now again, idea. the the dragging through a meadow, less healthy. Not great. Yeah, I would say <laughs> it's slightly less healthy. <laughs> all right. So having said all that, here's my big problem with her character. It's that towards the end of the movie, I don't understand what her motivations are, or frankly, what anyone's motivations are. So they finally consummate their marriage. And then the next morning she wakes up and like runs off to the train Mm -hmm. and John Wayne traces her, chases her down to the train. And I think the explanation given was like, you know, it's just the way things are done here. Anytime they need something to happen in this movie, they just say like, it's just the way of the Irish. Oh, it's just the way we do things around here, Bubby. So I don't understand (laughs) where she's going, why she's leaving, what the hell's going on. He gets her from the train. He drags her five miles so that he can fight her brother finally to to demonstrate to her that he will do what she wants of him if that's what she really wants, even though it's kind of going against his own principles. But then she's also like fighting against that and and trying to get away from him as he like carries her, drags her through this meadow. And I'm like, is is this not what you've been asking for the whole movie? Like, where are you trying to go? (laughs) I, I didn't understand exactly what anyone wanted in that moment of the film bob you just don't understand the beautiful nuance of a romantic (laughs) relationship in 1930s ireland you just you just don't get it bob actually i think that is a great explanation is just like when you are married and you're fighting with your spouse and you guys are just both digging your heels in and none of it makes sense anymore but you don't want to lose the argument you know, you just drag your wife through a field. Yeah, let it be known. <laughs> Film and whiskey podcast endorses spouse dragging, right? All about it. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think that genuinely, it felt, and this kind of gets back to what you were saying about how long the movie is. I think that everything up until that scene felt like it had a purpose. Yes. It felt like it was like, all right, it's driving the plot forward. But at that point, it was like. All right, we just need something funny. Well, what could we do? Uh, yeah, we'll just have him drag her through a field. Right. Uh, that that'll be funny. Uh, let's let's order that up. Get the uh, get the camera crew ready. We're gonna do it now. Well, so then they they get back to Victor McLaughlin, and he's like, "All right, fine. Here's your money." And then he gets the money, and Maureen O'Hara is not satisfied with that, and and has John Wayne throw it in the furnace, and is like, "No, what I really want is for you to beat my brother to a pulp." Which is really not her motivation through the whole movie. And, it, you know, again, if they want her brother beat up, like, I completely understand that impulse. He's the worst. But yeah, what she has said the whole time is like, I want this money. This money is mine. And, and it, then they throw it in the freaking steam engine. And it kind of turns <laughs> into. So there's a movie from a few years ago called Phantom Thread. It's a Paul Thomas Anderson movie. 
And that movie takes a very weird turn towards the end. And I, I'm going to try not to spoil the whole thing, but it essentially becomes this weird kink between the two main characters where one of them kind of poisons the other one repeatedly so that that character gets sick and that the other one can nurse the first one back to health. And it is like this weird psychosexual fetish thing at the end of the film. And it ruined the movie for me. I did not like that film, but I couldn't help but think of it the whole time I was watching this movie because I'm like, I don't think she even wants anything anymore other than just to like put John Wayne in this situation where she is in control of him and watching mm. and, and like this weird bloodlust. It seemed like this weird kink. And I was like, what purpose does this serve anymore? I didn't yeah, like the I whole mean, end of the movie didn't make sense from the character's motivations standpoint. Kink feels like a strong monosyllabic word to throw that way. Yeah. I I think that if anything, at a certain point, she wants to see her husband shine. And so if anything, it's it's more of a uh, lust for drama <laughs> than yeah. it is for anything else. But I, I, I see what you're saying that it at a certain point, it's like, man, he's right. Like he got your furniture back. He like he's providing for you. He is gentle and kind. He's honoring your wishes to not have sex, which, you know, who would have expected that from a 19, you know, 50s person? So, like, I at a certain point, I'm like, what are you even asking for anymore, Mary Kate? Like, and then when she finally gets the money, she just throws it in the in the fire. Right. And you're like, but then oh, also wait, I, still makes him follow through on the fight yeah, when they could have I mean, just walked away at that point. I don't I don't know if she makes him follow through because Victor just punches him in the face right after they throw it in. That's fair. So I I think it was more of a at this point the fight has to happen. Uh but no, I, I think you're right though. It's like she just has misguided motives right. by the end of the film. And they're weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's where this movie suffers, right? Is that it's overlong and also leaves random dangling threads. The best part of the movie from a cinematic point of view for me is that flashback to John Wayne when you find out that he killed the guy in the ring. Like the yeah. way it's filmed is very dreamlike. You don't see a crowd behind them. And like it's it's can very I, surreal. Can I also point out the camera? We we talked about in Raging Bull that it was the first time the camera had ever been inside the ring. However, the camera in The Quiet oh, Man yeah. was inside was the, in ring. the ring. Pointing at John Wayne's face. And the way they cut that montage together without sound of like, you know, Dude. his two trainers standing next to him smiling and then it cuts back to his face and it's this weird like Dutch angle close up. It, I mean, mm -hmm. it is incredible filmmaking. Yeah. And then it is never returned to. He never confesses that to anyone. He just is completely able to put this trauma behind him or at least ignore it for the course of the movie. And never deals with it again. And and I really was like, <laughs> okay, again, I know that like every movie in 2022, we want someone to have like baggage and trauma. And <laughs> so I'm not saying that, but it was just weird that it would be a focal point of the movie and then immediately dropped right after that fact. Well, I mean, he has the conversation with the Reverend Playfair about it and, you know, it tells him Playfair to shut up. He's like, don't you tell anybody. No, when he goes into his into his office at, oh, later that's right. in the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they look at the picture of, you know, Playfair as a boxer and, and they have a little conversation about like what it means to be a fighter in Ireland and what it what it takes to win his wife. Mm. I, I think I think they kind of tie that thread up nicely. I think there was one other dangling thing for me that I I need to ask your opinion on because I couldn't tell if they were implying that Maureen O'Hara is unable to have children. Um, hmm. when, when, the, you know, the, they bring the bassinet over to the house and she's like, it was my mother's before me. And she runs out crying. And then the next scene, she finds John Wayne planting roses back, you know, in the, essentially in their backyard and says like, oh, you could have planted a potato or something. And, and she's like, what's I, what good is a house without this and this? And then he says, or children. And the way she responds is she puts both of her hands under her stomach and kind of like rubs there. And I'm like, huh, I wonder if we're implying something here. And I didn't know if you caught on to that or if I was just like reading into things too much. Uh, if I'm being honest, I think you're reading into things. I think it's I think that was more of a commentary on like you're not having sex with me. 
and so we're not having children. Got it. And, and I, I, in my mind, I think that that was kind of a little bit of a biting remark from John Wayne, mm-hmm. but also just him being honest, saying, hey, I want to have kids and we are not having sex. Right. So, you know, don't don't give me shit about <laughs> <laughs> about planting roses well, that's also... that my dad and mom used to plant around the garden. Like, that has sentimental value for me. Yeah. Uh, back off a little bit. Well, and I think that's also kind of why I felt so comfortable talking about kinks at the end of this movie, because sex is kind <laughs> of the driving force behind this whole movie. She beats up his brother, and then at the end of the movie, like, the, the end of the movie is her tapping him on the shoulder to be like, let's f***. And then, and then they like <laughs> they run back to the house and it's like the end. And now she rewards him for his bloodlust. And I'm like, this is very, very kinky. Yeah. I mean, apparently John Ford gave her a line to whisper in his ear in that final scene. Uh-huh. And was it let's she she would not. She initially was like, I'm not going to say that line. But eventually he got her to agree to say the line and John Wayne did not know what the line was so that it would get like a genuine reaction. Oh, wow. And like to this day, Maureen O'Hara, you know, she I think she passed away uh, in 2015 or 16, but she always refused to tell anyone what that line was. So we still don't know what she actually whispered into his ear. I think I just gave it away. I think you might have. (laughs) And knowing their relationship, they probably went off and and, and did that very thing. Yeah. And and had some method acting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. It's time for us to wrap things up here. And before we give our final scores, we're going to play our new game, which we call Let's Make It a Double. Brad, if you had to pair this movie up with another one to make a double feature, what would that film be? Yeah, Bob, you know, I was thinking about this. And I think that I'm going to point towards another movie that you and I actually decided isn't necessarily a romantic movie or a romance movie, but I think I'm going to point people to About Time. Oh, interesting. What's it the connection also, there? I just think that the the relationship between the main characters in About Time has a lightheartedness about it that reminds me of Wayne and O'Hara in this film. Interesting. That, like, McAdams and uh, uh, Do- Donald Gleason. The the way that they interact with one another with such lightheartedness and love and tenderness, it just kind of reminds me of these two. I like that, man. I I would not have made that connection. Good pick. Yeah, thanks, man. I think for me, I'm going to go with another movie that has a similar vibe. And we didn't really touch on this that much, but there's something about movies coming out post-World War II where I think so many men went across the ocean and fought overseas and brought back like pieces of European culture with them. And there seemed to be like an openness to let's make movies about Americans going overseas. And so you get all these movies like American in Paris and this film. And a couple of years after American in Paris, Gene Kelly and Vincent Minnelli teamed back up for an adaptation of the Broadway musical Brigadoon. And I love Brigadoon and it is Dude, not Brigadoon a, is it's amazing not a, it's not a great movie like and it actually <laughs> no. is kind of slow and probably too long just like this movie and so it has like the exact same feel to it but it has Gene Kelly singing and dancing and so like it, <laughs> it like you could watch the quiet man and then throw on Brigadoon and it's like wow this just got even better for me so I would pair this up with Brigadoon you just take a little short hop from Ireland to Scotland and you know enjoy yourself you're all set yeah I love it, man. Let's get into final scores then, Bob. You you said earlier that you're going to give it like a four out of ten. So I'm bracing <laughs> myself. Where where are you at with uh, John Ford's The Quiet Man? I think that this is like when this movie came out, it was like an eight out of ten, right? Like it's it's clearly not the best film ever made. But I think the fact that it's an eight out of 10 film that's also aged by 70 years would probably knock it down a little bit to like a seven and a half in my book. I enjoyed this more than I enjoyed The African Queen. But when you have a two hour movie that we're advocating for taking 25 percent of the runtime away, like that's clearly a big flaw with the film. And, and you know, the other things about the plot that I've brought up that I don't really understand motivations and things like that. I'm going to knock it down and give it a seven and a half out of 10, but it's a really good seven and a half. 
Yeah, I think I'll give it an eight and a half out of ten. I, I think that it has some of the best one liners out of any movie that we've ever watched. Uh, I, I think that the pacing of the first 70 percent of the movie is really great. And then it slows down a lot. Um, so, yeah. I, and and the performances are just fabulous. Mm-hmm. So I I really love this movie and it's an easy eight and a half for me. All right. So those are our scores on The Quiet Man. But we'd like to know what you think. Brad, I have a feeling that this might be the least seen of the three John Ford movies we've done this season. But who knows? Maybe a lot of people have watched it and loved it like we have. You can reach out to us across our social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, at Film Whiskey. Or you can jump onto our Discord. We are on there every single day talking to you guys, uh, Film and Whiskey Nation. So jump on there, join the conversation. You can find a link to our Discord at the end of every single one of our show notes. Next week, we're going to start a mini series on a director who, uh, frankly, Brad, I didn't expect would be in something like this. But when you look at his movies, he's made some absolute classics. We're talking about Rob Reiner. And we're going to be looking at his early 90s horror masterpiece, Misery. I cannot wait for you to see this movie. Like, please go in as cold as possible to this film. Possibly the most incredibly talented yet, like, diversely interested director that we've ever seen. Like, all of his movies are different and, like, incredibly solid. I can't wait, man. All right, we'll kick that off with Misery. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time. Film and Whiskey Nation, do you ever think about awards? Of course you do. You drink whiskey and watch movies, which means that you know that nothing is validated until a group of random people say, hey, we love what you're doing. The awesome thing about Doc Swinson's whiskey is that it isn't just some group of schlubs that are giving them awards. They have been winning attention from some of the most important whiskey experts that you can imagine. They've been voted best distillery in Washington State by the New York International Spirits Competition. They've been voted the best independent bottler by the Ascot Awards, as well as the best finished bourbon from the Ascot Awards for their La Menta Exploratory Cask. Their Exploratory Cask series is where they release some of the most fascinating and adventurous experiments. If you're ever checking out Doc's lineup and see a white label, there's a really good chance that that's the only time you'll see that bottle, so make sure you snatch it up. Doc Swinson's has been offering just phenomenal finished and blended whiskeys for quite some time now. You can find them online at docswhiskey.com. That's D-O-C-S whiskey.com.